We have a bit of an odd duck here today. This is a Martin guitar from the 1960s, mid-60s, but uh, even in mint condition you'd be surprised at the price. It's much less than the value of a decent used car. This is a guitar designed for nylon strings. A classical, sort of. Uh, they really didn't catch on. Martin collectors didn't want a nylon string. Classical players didn't want a Martin. I remember reading an interview with Chris Martin IV in which he bemoaned the fact that the classical community didn't like it if they tried to put a brand name on the headstock. He really didn't have time for these guitars. Didn't like them. But if you look at it in a certain light, Martin as a company has this huge wellspring or history of what might be considered classical guitar building. Basically anything they produced from the 1830s all the way up into the early 1920s could be considered a classical, depending on your definition, because they were designed around gut strings. As we've discussed before, Christian Friedrich Martin evidently took some inspiration from Spanish makers and experimented extensively with fan bracing systems well up into the 1850s. I mean, the distinction between a classical versus a folk versus a popular guitar really couldn't be made at that time. They all used the same instrument until the gradual introduction of steel strings in the early 20th century. That much vaunted X-brace is a design from, well, almost a hundred years previous to the introduction of steel strings. So it too is a classical bracing variant. I've mentioned it before, but Julian Bream, who has recently departed, a uh, major figure in the world of classical guitar, gave his first public concert on an old Martin. When they decided to switch over to steel, Martin jumped in all the way. By 1926, all of their standard guitars were built for steel strings, and it was like that for 10 years when they introduced the G series, which is marketed towards classical players or well, people who just wanted to play on the older gut strings. Those G series guitars are cosmetically, well, they're basically identical in size and shape to the standard model guitars, uh, including the bridge. They used pin bridges. They're just made lighter. You know, the bracing pattern went back a couple of decades to what they were doing around the turn of the century. Maybe that's the reason I've never, ever seen one in the flesh. I expect through the years many people just put steel strings on them because they look like a steel string guitar, and they self-destructed. In 1962, they did a bit of a design overhaul, and they changed the body shape into something more traditionally Spanish. Not quite a Spanish guitar, but getting there. And they came out with the Triple O 28C, which has Brazilian rosewood back and sides, Sitka top, simple rosette, three ring rosette like you find in a standard Martin, and this kind of baffling bridge design that looks sort of like a big tongue depressor. I don't understand it at all. You know, Martin being an extremely conservative company, trying to market an instrument to an even more conservative community in classical guitarists. You know, there are some precedents for rounded wing bridges in certain areas of Spain in the 1850s, etc. But this is not common, you know. That's a radical departure from the norm in the classical guitar world, especially at that time, when everyone was, you know, playing whatever Segovia was playing. If the guitar didn't look like that, it was wrong, bad, don't... You couldn't be seen in the community. Like, this is... Mm, what's going on with that bridge? Weird, man. In 1966, they got around to making this lower-cost mahogany version, the 0018C. This is an example of that. Um, it is, in fact, from the first year of production, 1966. A couple of years after this, they went and rearranged the body design again. Um, they came out with something that was, well, it was very similar to a Ramirez. And they went with the more standard mosaic rosette rather than the three rings, uh, which is what people expect to see on a classical. And they came out with the N20. And there's only really one N20 you need to know about. People send me links about it trying to teach me about its existence, and that there is a man named Mark Earlwine who looks after it, and I should pattern my life after his. And then there were, I mean, these are well-meaning folk who usually don't play guitar, uh, but they want to connect somehow. Yes, we're talking about Trigger, Willie Nelson's guitar. No, Mark isn't Dan Earlwine's brother, he's his cousin. And yes, it's a fascinating example of how beat up a guitar can get and still be playable which is really a testament to Martin's construction techniques and, you know, Mark's uh, 
you know, dogged determination to keep it running. But, you know, that's it. That's the only famous Martin classical guitar. This guitar has been faced with some acts of violence over the years. There's a patch that's been put into the soundboard, several repaired cracks, and one that is still open and needs some attention. But most challenging is this. Big hit. Missing wood. Broken lining. That's the main task here, putting this back together. Um, absolute invisibility is not expected. Just want a nice secure fix, and I think we can handle that. There's a nice reminder branded on the inside. Made for gut or nylon strings. There's some evidence of previous repair down by the tail block. The bracing system is fairly simple. Just three rather stout fans and one transverse or diagonal treble bar, which is scalloped. This top crack is fairly tight, which is nice. It's also kind of odd in that it veers off. It doesn't follow the grain line directly. It jumps over. Gluing the crack proceeds as usual. I'm using fish glue this time. Painted on rather thickly, grab my suction cup and pump it right through to the other side of the soundboard. Then using the longest of my long reach clamps, I'll put some pressure on with a piece of acrylic plastic, uh, bridging the crack to try and keep it level. A gentle squeeze for some lateral pressure and we'll let that dry. On to the damage on the back. It's a pretty complex break. Some remnants here have been taped in place. There is a fragment of binding and some bits of lining as well, which could come in handy. Several large cracks spread up into the back. There are loose areas as well where it's come up off the lining and one spot that is kind of divoted down. This is another one of those annoying situations where the edges of each of these broken pieces don't really want to fall into the same plane in any easily maintainable way. Um, I can get one of them and then I can sort of get the other, but getting them all at the same time is difficult. So this is going to surprise some people, but I'm actually going to start off by using thin super glue on these cracks because they're so thin that they're perfectly tight and we're dealing with capillary action. If I can hold these together while it sets, I can do them one at a time and then get this into one sort of unifying plane, then I can work at sticking that back down again. Um, but I don't, con I can't conceive of a way of doing them all together at the same time. And the super glue I think is going to be the quickest, most reliable way of doing that. I'll put cleats on these afterwards to hold them in position. I think that's the best way of doing it. The other thing about the super glue is it doesn't have a tendency to swell up the wood, which could make fitting the other pieces together even more difficult because they're very tight. I'm not going to use accelerator on this because that tends to, or it can make um, the finish sort of cloudy. Not the finish, but the glue itself can turn kind of whitish. So I'm going to let this sit for about 10 minutes, come back, and then work on the next one. I'm not sure if it comes across, but I'm acting like a human clamp as the glue goes in, holding one edge down to register it with the other side. Near the edge I can use tape for the same purpose. You don't want to allow thin glue to seep under masking tape. It does something funny with the tape adhesive and it makes a real mess of things. I need to sand the inside surface clean and level in a place that's very difficult to reach, so I'm sticking some sandpaper to a magnet. One nice thing about Martin nylon strings from this period is that the sound hole is about 10 millimeters, 3 eighths of an inch wider than your standard classical guitar. So it's really luxurious when you're having to reach inside. I can guide the sanding remotely with another magnet outside. On an old finish like this, it might be better to put a piece of paper between it and the back, but I know I'm going to be spraying stuff over top anyhow. After sanding, I need to clean off the surfaces. I've got some nice spruce for the cleats. Just an old soundboard offcut. They don't have to be too thick. Two millimeters is plenty 
Um, sometimes I look inside guitars and find these massively overbraced cleats, and they always give me a laugh. Using the marking gauge keeps them a uniform size, and scoring them on the underside uh, makes it a cleaner cut when the saw breaks through. I'll knock off the corners with some sandpaper. This gives it sort of a truncated pyramidal shape, which uh, apparently makes it more difficult for them to come off. Magnets hold them on while the glue dries, obviously. Okay, now that the cleaning is done, the back plate is fully secure. It's good and strong now. I need to inlay a little piece of mahogany, but before I can do that, I want to make sure the edges of the plate are fully secured to the lining, specifically these two pieces here, because they were loose. I'll also replace the missing part of the lining as well. As for the binding, the little portion that was left over is not long enough and is only a fragment. And the top edge is actually damaged on this side here. It's broken in a very strange way, so I'm going to be cutting that back slightly and replacing the whole length. A sharp chisel held at right angles does most of the work. Well, that's a little risky, but it, it turned out okay. Upon inspection, I find that the lining is actually still stuck to the back, but loose from the side. So I'll drill some little holes in inconspicuous places to get glue further in there and inject it. This is fish glue again. And a spool clamp will hold things in place. Now for the mahogany patch. I'll plane it to thickness and then carve it by hand and sand it to shape by hand too, mostly because my disc sander is out in the unheated shed and it's minus 20 degrees out there. I'll use the patch as its own template and with a very fresh scalpel blade, I'll get the outline. I'll pare away to that line with chisels and knives and it will fit very well. I'll begin scraping down the little super glue mounds. The razor has cellophane tape on each end to act as a depth stop, but you still have to be pretty careful because it's a very thin finish and uh, well, the back also has a slight curvature on it. A freshly sharpened chisel to pare down the patch. In this case, the masking tape on the back is acting as the depth stop. Leave just enough to sand. I'll cut away the excess and file the edge of the patch so it's in line with the outline of the body. This is a purfling cutter. It's adjustable and there's a brass fence which registers against the side of the guitar and helps score the line. I just score it then I go back and pair to the line using knives and chisels. I'll then cut some black binding to length. I've deeply scored the glue surface on this so that my tight bond glue has something to grip to it. Tight bond works fine and is much less toxic than the other stuff and has less of a tendency to mess up the finish around the patch. I'll work on the contour and the thickness of the binding patch so that it looks similar to what's around it. There are several missing chunks and divots in the side under the binding where the break happened like really deep divots. It must have been dropped hard on something several times. I opted to use some epoxy putty on those. Get that in there. Let it cure for an hour. Then come sanding. Now There's only so much leveling you can do by sanding because the finish on these started off thin and got even thinner as it dried out over the years. It's about the thickness of a piece of paper. So we do what we can. I'll apply what's known as a spit coat of thin shellac over the areas I'm going to retouch. Just provides a good bonding surface. In this shot, you can see someone else's patch on the other side too. Same thing on the back. The shellac also acts to bring back the gloss so the colors pop and I'll be able to match my colors with what is there. Like I mentioned with the headstock last week, I'm using blend all powdered stain both wet and dry brush to come up with something close. You know, this is all somewhat similar to architectural trompe l'oeil in that it can look really good from one or two angles. 
but the dichroic effect of wood grain means that as you get away from looking at it head on, the suspended pigment is going to show up much darker or lighter than the surrounding wood. So I'm shooting for not so glaringly obvious. After this, I have to shoot a bunch of coats of lacquer over top so I have something to level sand again and not cut into the touch-up layers. Okay, I'm going to call that good enough. This has had a couple of coats of lacquer and it will need more because as the areas of retouching have a thickness to them and sort of undulation, I mean it's very thin but it's there and I need to lock that in under enough lacquer that I can go back and um, sand and buff and I think you get the point. For a more in-depth study in this kind of touch-up work I always suggest subscribing to Ian Davlin's Patreon. Ian hates guitars. He's got a course on there called The Ding Kings where he goes deep, shows the more technical aspects, color matching, etc. I gloss over that information because well he's done the work and it's his thing and that's info that you should be willing to pay for if you're really serious about this stuff. You know, it's fun to watch, but it's valuable information to those in the trade, you know? Anyway, this is going to take some time to finish and cure, but I put some strings on it so we can hear what it sounds like. Well, the strings are brand new, so they're probably going to stretch out of tune, but them's the brakes. <laughs>